I, I posted the the Pablo Escobar meme photo, mm. the weighted. Um, and what happened, and it was kind of like, I asked, like, what did you do when you were weighted? It was kind of my one thing. It was kind of a little jokey, but it was like, I, there's only so many times you can clean the house. There's only so many times I can, like, pack the car ready for the hospital, like, whatever. Um, I had the most beautiful response, largely from fathers who p commented on the post. I probably had about 20, 30 comments. <laughs> Part two with my man, Hugh. You're a father now. You have I'm a, a dad. I'm a dad. <laughs> it's crazy. Awesome. I'm surviving. You're surviving. Uh, yes. That's my first question is like, are you sleeping? I, I'm sleeping more than I was expected. Funny, quick anecdote. One of my business partner, one of my closest friends messaged me a couple of weeks in. Uh, this is probably about a week and a half ago. And he was like, so you had a couple of weeks in. How does fatherhood sleep deprivation compared to sleep deprivation in a hundred mile running race? Because I've run for, I've been awake for 36 hours running through mountains. Um, and so I said, it's different. There's a, it becomes surreal when you go completely without sleep, like not even an ounce of sleep for over 24, 30 hours. But what I'm seeing with this one is that it's a, it's a cumulative build. Yeah. Now we've been blessed. We've been blessed. We we came out um, not to short to. He's a big boy. He's a big boy. Um, we can talk more about that. Um, but I think as a result, he's sleeping a little more than my, some might expect. And so we've been blessed. Like, of course, he wakes up. Of course, there's feeding during the nights. But we're getting more naps during the night than I was expecting. So that's the first one. The the one that gets me the most with number two is when I go to bed and I'm ready. And then uh, she's have she's been having colds the past month or so, and so then the coughing fit kind of starts, and it's that like I physically I want to sleep and my body's like sleep please sleep and I keep getting jostled up. It's that between waking and sleeping moment where like I'm almost hitting REM and then I'm back back up again then almost hitting REM and then like there's almost like this pain I feel in my body of like my body saying please, please sleep. And I, and I'm just like, Oh, I'm awake because I need to know if my baby's okay. Um, what's, what's your experience? So it's, it's funny timing is, um, so last night was one of the nights where, um, he woke up, you know, we fed, went down, woke up, fed, went down in the morning, but for some reason he was making all these noises last night <laughs> and much more than normal and they kept waking me up and he's still in the bedroom um and i think that's going to be a while uh, mom mom wants him there for a while um and so it, i was just couldn't believe but these weren't crying noises they're just all sorts of noises like stirring and then stopping and so in a similar because it wasn't sickness i don't think i had anxiety or like poor baby but it was like but yes, it was a similar one. I was like starting to fall asleep and I hear this like noises and I started to, I mean, like in the middle of a dream and then I'm here, his noise, his cooing in the dream and then I'm out of the dream. I'm in the dream. I'm out of the dream. So that's, that's surreal. It's such it's a surreal. And I, so... and I have noticed, I will say we're so tomorrow is his one month birthday. <gasps> Congrats. That's, awesome. that's um, awesome. And I am starting to note some cumulative that's the sort of the, yeah, I know we're only, I was still so early in, but like the cumulative, like fatigue is the wrong thing of just like every night being like this. Yes. Are you, I mean, how's your, like, how are you, man? How are you handling this? What are you doing to catch up on sleep? What are you doing to get your extra rest? If, um, if you're doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we're still figuring out schedules of everything, obviously. Um, but one of the things I am really focused on um, what what the what meditation looks like for me, or what the kind of mindfulness exercise is, such that two minutes or five minutes of that can be more refreshing and rejuvenating than like a five minute nap. Um, and so that's one I'm trying to like trying to top up with those, not only because it is restful, but also to then be more hopefully be more present and uh, more able to respond positively than negatively in what's coming next. So I'm not perfect by any man, but some, I mean, I have my little office here, which I come to do podcasts, but I'm 10 minutes from home. So then I can leave and go home. 
And so I'm trying to do a bit more like almost like take two or five minutes on my little pink couch behind me before I walk out because I go into the car to go home. Mm. Or even more, I'm, I'm doing a little, I'm doing a thing called, uh, a friend took me through this program called Positive Intelligence, which is all about like a practice um, about my, it's, it's really sort of mindfulness. It's, uh, it's by this, um, uh, you know, PhD neuros like from, from Stanford entrepreneur who's created, he has a famous, his name's Shirzad. Uh, I can't remember his last name. He has a pretty famous Ted talk, um, which you might, you might want to link uh, in the, in the show notes. Um, uh, and I'll send you the link. And so, and so basically he, um, he talks about your saboteurs and your saves, this idea you have these, like the patterns of behavior, the judge, the avoider, the victim, and then your sage, which is, you know, that, that you're, you at your finest, your, your, your essence, your, your wisest. Um, and this idea of, of building those powers with self-command. Just think mindfulness. So all I say is he's taken mindfulness, made it a bit more actionable. So if there's an app, it can remind you, you can do two minutes. Well, I've taken to do in one, I have 10 minutes in the car trying to do some of this mindfulness while I'm driving. So instead of listening to a podcast or instead of listening, you know, calling a friend, it's 10 minutes of guided mindfulness. Eyes open, obviously, I'm driving. And it is a, it's an eyes open. It's not like I'm, I'm eyes open when it should be closed. And it's just, what are you observing? What are you hearing? What do you feel in your breath? Like, and so I'm just finding, trying to like, oh, take advantage. Can I do that for 10 minutes in my 10 minute drive home and then walk into the house a little bit better prepared? I love that. One of the things, there's, there's two ways that I've been doing that lately as well. Uh, one was... When I'm driving now, I'll find that I just turn off the radio and just really focus on being really intentional. Mm. I'm super reminded of uh, Dan Sullivan's story about how he was so distracted one day when he was driving home and then he realized it was like a 45 minute drive or something and he couldn't remember any of it. He was like, I was completely on autopilot. He was like, oh, let me, let me take this moment to be mindful. And then the other way, and this is like the small hack, I think, is the doing that exact thing when brushing your teeth. So rather than thinking about and debriefing, but just being completely like, am I hitting every single tooth? Am I actually, you know, cause I have one of those sonic vibrating ones. So uh-huh. like, is, yes. is every part of it going? And then, then like hanging out in the flossing and just, just can be completely focused on this activity. And what I, uh, and then I guess a third place I've done it is I try and do a 15 to 20 minute walk mm. by myself or with my dog every single day. And the first time I did it, I was listening to Atlas of the Heart, Brene Brown, and I loved it. And then I was like, man, I don't know if, I, if I'm getting really what I want here because I was more listening to her as opposed to enjoying what I was doing. And then now I just don't turn any of it on and I'm just hanging out and I'm looking at my neighborhood and looking at the trees and looking at the horizon and, and taking the sights in. And I think it's a much more intentional and present moment, present experience. It's crazy a little bit when we think about the modern concept of what a new baby does when it comes into the house, that we're having a conversation about integrating a mindfulness, a mindfulness exercise. Um, I know I have my opinions on the way that modern culture and Hollywood kind of portray like the, the popular consciousness of what, what fatherhood, what a new baby in the house, what early motherhood should be. Now that you're on the other side of it, like what have been your reactions? We had a discussion at part one about your expectations. What's been met? What hasn't been met? What has really surprised you? What's, what's something that happened that like, I had no idea this was happening. That's completely unexpected. Wow. Um, I'm with you. Everyone has an opinion about, about fatherhood and parenting mm-hmm. and, and the things that people were saying in advance, we were one, we were a, a week, we were 10 days late past our due date. And uh, one thing, it was kind of a little jokey, but it was like, I, so you have so many times you can clean the house. There are only so many times I can like pack the car ready for the hospital, like whatever. Um, I had the most beautiful response, largely from fathers who p- commented on the post. I probably had about 20, 30 comments. And they shared their, the father's perspective of the birth story. We were one week early. We went in late. We went into induce, so we had no waiting. We went on the date that was scheduled. We went in. There was no uncertainty. Oh, we had this situation. Some people messaged me directly. This little vignette of a birth story 
from fathers. And so it was very serendipitous. Um, but in that context, anyway, there was a lot of reference, enjoy the sleep while you can, rest, 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 you know? So that whole, and so I would say it has been amazing. I mean, of course we're not getting a ton of sleep at times, um, but it's just been this beautiful experience. I think we've been blessed by so far, who knows how long this will last or things will change, a, a baby that sleeps um, and he's a happy chappy um, and he seems to settle. Um, mom and mom and dad are in alignment on the strategy. Everyone has an opinion. We are doing things I'm sure some parents uh, would uh, uh, shake their head at. And uh, um, uh, I know some people are in the, we, we are following the schedule um, in terms of feeding the schedule. So that's our plan. That was one that Zoe wanted to, to follow, which means during the daytime, not at nighttime so much, but during the daytime, we wake a sleeping baby. I know a lot of people have strong opinions about waking or not waking a sleeping baby. Um, but we're doing us, right? Which is kind of neat. And so it has been much more enjoyable as an overall than I thought. Just, I think it's really interesting as a father how to support a breastfeeding mom. Mm. She's doing so much work. Yes. Um, and she's not even pumping that much right now. And so I really feel at times I'm like, I, ca how, I, can't, I can't fill the gap here. I can't take a feed in. It's not even, the, I, there's not in a bottle. So I can be like, you just go sleep and like I'll feed from this bottle at this stage. Um, and so at times I feel there's a little bit of like, what am I doing to pull my weight? And then there's times there's, some, there's things that I can do. And sometimes there's things you can't do. Um, but I surprisingly found like doing chores more enjoyable than I thought. It's like, well, I'm doing my part. More laundry, laundry in the washer, into the dryer, clean, do the dishwasher, make some coffee, top up her drink every time she breastfeeds. It's like these little things have sort of, be I've started to find little bits of joy in them. And of course, I'm in charge of the dogs right now. We have two dogs. And it has been, I suppose like that's the funniest part of this whole ex experience. Our, we have a Malamute. And it is like he has to observe everything. Every bath time, he is like, you're doing it wrong, mom. You're doing it wrong, dad. He's just there by the bath, paws out, watching us. Every diaper change, if, if the door's open, he's in the room watching us. It's kind of crazy. They are um, our forever toddlers, our furry forever toddlers. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite moments here is, so we have Luna, and she is um, super jealous she gets super jealous. So whenever I'm holding baby or mom's holding baby and we're in a place like on the couch or something like that, there's the other one has the dog. So it's like, if I'm holding baby, Luna's on mom. If mom's holding baby, Luna's on me. And yeah, so, it's, cool. so it's fun. Uh, this is, this is a really great topic. I noticed that um, with our breed. So we had a Italian water dog, Rom mm -hmm. Romana, Itali whatever, Italian water dog. Looks like a poodle. Everybody thinks it's a poodle, but it's, mm -hmm. it's a specific breed. Really got, uh, really integrated very, very quickly. So uh -huh. very much like, ah, this is another, another um, family member. This is a, not necessarily another alpha, because I think that mm -hmm. as long as the baby is smaller than her, there's going to be a little bit of weirdness, but um, as far as like, who's the dominant one, but she doesn't do that at all. Uh, it was really interesting and relaxing to see and knowing that, ah, dog's not gonna be a problem. I didn't have any issues. Mama had a little bit of issues about the integration there. You got two, like, what are you noticing in the dynamics of the dogs, how they're, how they're reacting? So we have one older dog, Lily. She's probably 50 and she's a mutt. She's the sweetest girl ever, ever, ever. And so she continues to just be the sweetest girl. Uh, and she's old. And so she's, th there was an inquisitiveness. We were interested when Cortado was a rescue. He's three years old. He's an Alaskan Malamute with some chow. He has a blue tongue. So we don't know exactly what he, what he is. Um, but it's, uh, so he's, he can be needy. He's often been the center of attention, but it's, it's almost like he's taken on a role. So it's not being like, Hey, this is competition for my attention. You know, we, he'll be there. We'll have baby on the bed and he'll be on the bed next to us looking at the baby. It's like he's part of the parenting. And like, mm. they're always very protective of the front door. We have a glass front door and he stands at the front door for hours just looking out and then barking at other dogs. Even though he'd never bark at a dog outside on the street, but if they're outside the front door, 
So I, I'm, I'm, I choose to see. I, it seems more in line. We're on the same team. You know, he has a has a role, and like I said, there's this inquisitiveness that particularly in the first week or two every time there's a crime baby he wanted to be there to see like what's happening and we were joking we my wife and i of, often joke that about we we talk out what we believe is his inner monologue oh and <laughs> and so zoe's like he's like and and her and, and her her interpretation of his monologue is daddy daddy mommy's doing it wrong she's changing changing the diaper wrong she's doing the thing that was his like you know because he was there and he would look at me and then look at her and like so that was the the model the, the our interpretation and having fun with and so it has been you know what's interesting actually there was a transition which they were um they were dogs who were in the bedroom before baby and now we have a little doggy jail area like a uh, basically where the, the you know where our back patio door is and it's a tile floor which is where the dog food it's like a little it's sort of like and the laundry room's off it and that's always been the place we we have a little baby gate there which we've had for years whenever we go out that's where the dogs stay when we go out leave the house they now sleep in there um every night and it was a, it was a big transition because they'd always been bedroom dogs but they've really thrived to it and now lily takes herself to bed every night so the gates open during the day. She takes herself there. Cortado's usually lying around somewhere. They, they seem to have just adapted to that really because it was too much. What we found is that if baby stirs at night, then they stir to, to see what's happening. And they want to walk over to see the baby during the night and added noise, not so much to wake up baby, but to wake us up, like clip clopping across the wooden floor. That's um, That's super fascinating. And... Um, I'm definitely going to maybe incorporate a little bit of that into us, but you know, I, I like the the other toddler in the bed too. Um, we've had a, a reasonable integration there. Our funny story is um, baby was crying. This would have been within month one baby was crying. And so Luna was getting used to it and mom walked by the baby. And then Luna kind of did like a double take and then like turned to mom and was like, bark, bark, like, Hey, the baby's crying. <laughs> the baby's making noise. Like, let's go. So like cool. yeah uh the breed is wicked smart and luna's very yeah. trainable and very observant and uh well that's awesome i suppose uh, the other I, highlight that ties into the dog um probably one of my highlights has been taking uh henry on walks mm -hmm. in the stroller we were blessed we've been gifted so much stuff by so many people um and it's such a, an amazing, um, amazing gift. This stuff is not cheap. Um, but the thing that made it for me, it meant I didn't have to make decisions. So her sister gave us their Bob running stroller, which meant I didn't spend 20 hours going down the rabbit hole trying to research running strollers. Um, and so we have this stroller. And so from the get-go, we started taking him out. The car seat fits in the stroller. And, and so I go out with him in the stroller and Cortado, the dog, and Cortado, it's almost like we have truly a pack now. He he run, he he goes perfectly alongside the stroller. It's like they're like my little team, and it is like and and we are right by the river walk. We're in South San Antonio. There's the, a beautiful part of the river walk without any stuff. It, it's not commercial. It's just out, outdoors. So we walk along the river. And I've got and it's it's Texas in winter. We're blessed as well. Sort of anything from fifties to seventies. So that has just been my favorite. We did an hour and a half walk on Saturday morning and he slept, little Henry slept for the whole thing. So it oh, was awesome. kind of neat. So that's so awesome. That's great. Yeah. I, I love the story of the, the pack integration. I know a lot of people get really uh, nervous having dogs, you know, like with kids and stuff like that. But, um, and while there are probably some, some rough stories, I, you know, we've been domesticating that that specific species for 30,000 years. Like right. the only other longer species has been bees, which people don't understand, but we've yes. domesticated bees as well. Um, that uh, they understand probably more about what we, than we do consciously, subconsciously, they understand more subconsciously about what's happening than we do. Um, and it's kind of built in. And I think it's really built in for them to do that. Uh, what else, what, what else has been going on? What other interesting stories or, uh, observations we can have for our feel good fatherhood listeners. I mean, it's so, so uh, just seeing him wake up because obviously we are, you know, we've made a decision to do be, live on a schedule. There's this beautiful moment where it's like, Oh, it's, I'm going to wake him up and change him and then hand him to mom to breastfeed. 
And so I have this beautiful, like I, I talk to him and gently wake him up and maybe unzip him out of like a swaddle thing. And the wake up routine is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And it's pretty similar each time. It's this like stretching. He stretches like a superhero. Then he turns and he arcs his back. Then he stretches his legs. Then he does a couple of toots. You know, he, it's like there is this a personality in all of this that's like I was not expecting to see so much personality so soon for something that does not cannot only communicates with crying. And it's only really started to the beginnings of cooing and a little bit more like, you know, smiling or cooing. But there's this personality out of this essentially blob. Right. And it's that's wild. And I think ties into that. I can't remember um, wh when we had, did our last podcast, whether we talked about his name. Did we talk about his name? Uh, I don't. Well, let's let's do something. So, so Zoe loved the idea of calling him Hank, like a sort of very American name, sort of very, in my mind, like Huckleberry Finn. Kind of, I don't know. There's something like Hank is this like beautiful. And I liked it that Hank being short for Henry. And so, you know, so we'd named him pretty early on once we knew he was a boy. And so we'd been talking about Hank and Henry, Henry and Hank or whatnot. Um, and it's this American British, like lovely little dichotomy. Mm -hmm. But so far he's a Henry. He's a, he's not a Hank yet. I mean, maybe he'll become a Hank. Maybe as a toddler, he'll be a little Hank, but he's, so it's like, how does like almost the personality of a name for something that's so new. Um, and so that's, what's kind of, sort of quite magical is sort of seeing that that it's like this personality so much even at such an early moment in the development there's so much power in what we name things because it it's sort of the first step in our perception it's the first mm. step in the way that we interface with a person and so uh think about all the henry's or hanks that you've known in your life right whenever you say hank or he's a hank or he's a henry you're going to bring in all that past information, right? Um, all that past uh, experience and relation to that. Uh, my burning question here is when did you start seeing the personality? So like, was it a, cause I think of, I have in my mind when I started seeing it in baby two, like when was the week, like it was a specific week where it's, ah, here's the personality. When did you start experiencing it? I mean, I think for sure it was um, within that first 10 days. I mean, we spent, uh, you know, a couple of days in the hospital, then came home. So it was probably, you know, towards the end of that first week, it was this whole like seeing this, it was this wake up routine, I think was for me. It was like, hey, there's this like th this be this personality waking up from his slumber. Um, so I think that's for me when I started to see it. I mean, but even though there was, I mean, I feel like there were glimpses of personality in the, you know, in the the room at the hospital. Right? In terms of so early on, we did. Um, so funny story, and maybe this is an interesting segue. Um, we were late, you know, Zoe was past due, and we were scheduled to go in for an induction. And we show up in the hospital um, and the, the short story is, is it, it turns out that, you know, they started to do the monitoring before they start to induce. It turns out she started having contractions. Um, uh, shout out to Iris Gonzalez, if she hears this podcast, who uh, a few after seeing my LinkedIn post messaged and said, hey, I did acupuncture um, that kickstarted my pregnancy. And, and she's in San Antonio. She's like, and she gave a referral, which is what we took up on. So who knows? So she started having contractions, uh, you know, 24 hours after the acupuncture, who knows, but anyway, that, that word, but whatever was happening, baby wasn't responding great to contractions. So like heart rate was dropping after a contraction or whatever. So they're like, Hey, we don't even want to start inducing. And at this point then this is like, I don't know, 11 p.m. in the evening, they, they recommended, a, a, a we say we should go ahead with a C-section. Not what we had planned. Mm. No, everything was very calm. Um, and so we had, as parents, had to start reevaluating, like, you know, sort of evaluating what this looks look like. This is a surgery. But also it's like, wow, we're going to see Henry really quickly. 
Like, because at that point, I assumed that we were going to be laboring for 12 or with an induction, maybe before something happens, then another 12 plus hour, 24 hours of labor, and who knows? Um, so suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, we're going we're gonna to see Henry soon. Um, and then one neat thing, they came in at this point and they're like, hey, um, the photo- this is about midnight or something, like, the photographer is about to go, go home for the day. Would you like her to stay and take pictures? And I was like, uh, we were like, sure. <laughs> and at this point, the thing was, we had it, we'd, we'd, I can't remember if we mentioned this, we, we hired a doula. Um, yes. Because and part of that was for Zoe it, it, to help in the laboring process. Part of it was Hugh to put. It was like I love the idea of someone to put my me my me me at ease during the process. So anyway, as soon as we're going to for where they, they say we're getting this ready for the OR, they're like your doula can't come in. Only one person in the in the OR. Um. So at that point, then the doula was going to take photographs. That was part of the thing. She was going to take photographs that put whenever just at the birth or like us immediately afterwards. So now when they said, oh, would you like a photographer? So we kind of sort of said, oh, sure. And this is another one where I trust the universe. But it was this beautiful experience because this photographer was sort of on our team doing this whole process. She was the photographer of the hospital. So she knew all the nurses and she actually functioned as a bridge between us and the nurses and the people in the OR that was not part of the medical team, but was kind of on our team. And so what's kind of amazing is she caught, she captured some incredible photos leading up to the birth, after the birth. And then she gave us, we did photos. It, because of that, we did photos in our, you know, in the hospital before we left a day or so later. And so as you look at some of those photos, even now you see personality. There's one of him, me, mom, and baby, and he's smiling. And it's like the personality was showing from the get-go. So I'm not sure that was a ramble, still in a little response to the personality question, um, but was this kind of special part of that experience. I think something that I want to highlight for a feel-good father who's listening is this really this importance of this team and the way... uh, one of one of the things that I went through, uh, it was a couple months before the birth, is that I had this um, irrational, like, nobody's on my team, got to protect, figure out what's going on, like crazy stress that was happening. Um, and I think that what when I look at things after the fact, it's all irrational. It's all in my head. It's not. It's not even real. There's probably some sort of evolutionary or nurture from my experience reason why I had this this going through my head and why I had that reaction. But in your story, you have this consistent thematic people are on my team. I'm grateful for the help that we've been getting. So many people have been around us. And that perspective, as we were mentioning, and if we bridge that, that perspective of the name and the name brings with a perspective of everything we're experiencing. I think as well for a feel good father that people are here to help me. We're going to make this really great. We're, and it's like, they're here to help me. They're here to help mom. They're here to help baby. Right. And, and knowing that, uh, I think that that is, uh, something that as fathers, we should be prepared to do, you know, kind of, I, I, I love that. And it's, but, and it's also, um, accepting help. Yes. Um, so one of the things we have some amazing neighbors, um, and one of them who's, you know, was so kind and gave us so much stuff after she had two, two boys and she's through, through, and she's like, you can take it. I, we wanted out of the house, take it all, you know? And so we were, we were so blessed with, with being gifted and donated so much stuff to us. Um, but one of the things she kept messaging leading up to the birth, she's like, Hey, I'm going to organize a meal train for you. Do you have people we can put on there? And we're like, well, that's, we'll love it. But like asking people to put them on the meal train. Um, but it was, that was one of the be- most beautiful things. Like, and we didn't, it's not like we had, we had, we were blessed. Like our life wasn't so crazy that like we needed a meal every, every night. Like, but those occasions, particularly like the, it often coincided with the weekends for the first few weeks, you know, on a Friday and a Sunday, we'd have a meal will be showing up for us. And it was so beautiful. I'm so appreciated for those meals. And often they were home cooked meals with some of our neighbors on our streets. Um, but it, it was just, that was something just, to, it was to accept the help and to accept, to, to, be, you know, to be like, hey, one of our friends has created a meal train if you'd like to join and sort of bridging that sort of accepting and asking of something very small 
Um, but it was like so beautiful. And, and, and those little things we sort of really appreciated. Uh, I like to cook and we've been doing like Blue Apron lately. And my Blue Apron went out the freaking window. Like that was just, you know, as in it was like that little bit too much of cooking, too much preparation. And so I ended up putting it as a pause and, you know, just doing even simpler meals or it was just very interesting. So anytime someone, gave, you know, would bring a meal over was really, really appreciated. Now that you mentioned that, one of the things that we did, that we did very well for pregnancy one, and then we did as well for number two was we had about a month's worth of, of meals just pre like frozen and done and made. Yeah. And so we just did that. Um, that was really helpful because it, in that moment where it's like, you okay? You, and there's, uh, I joke, I joke because uh, the last time you and I were in person, I was so sleep deprived. I don't remember a lot of the details of that event. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so I was performing and doing this stuff and yes. I, I like, I know what I'm doing, but a lot of it, like I was, I was sustained by caffeine and, mm -hmm. and just, and the experience of how I had done it in the past. Amazing. And a lot of it is just a blur of, of that. And, uh, I know cause every night I would hit, you hit like nine o'clock central and just I'd be done. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, my totally. body needs to catch up on sleep. So, uh, that, that kind of that pre prep, I think is really great. And that's like the second takeaway I think here would be you had these gifting and people that were extending on your LinkedIn posts, people that were extending the wisdom of their experience and sharing mm -hmm. their beauty and, and their, and, and their, um, their wisdom, people that were extending the gifts, right. And we consider ourselves lucky because we have these moments and we have, um, these, this community and these people around us that are willing to, to help out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things for feel good fatherhood and, you know, having that strong sense of community, having, and being very intentional that, uh, you know, the idiom is it takes a village to raise kids. Uh, yeah. the, 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 not the, the data that I heard somewhere was it takes three sets of parents to raise one kid. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible, isn't it? We've been blessed. Um, it's interesting. We have a real dichotomy in that um, Zoe's mom, um, uh, who lives in Houston, recently bought a house and re re remodeled a house in San Antonio, about 10 minutes from us. And, and it was finished just before Christmas. And so just, and so it's been amazing that she's been, and, and you know, uh, her and stepdad have been able to be around a fair amount in our first few weeks. And it's been wonderful, not just, I mean, it's been incredible to, well, first up, it's been incredible to watch Zoe, you know, grow as a mom. That's like one of the most beautiful things you can ever, ever witness. And sort of the mother, the mother hen uh, is just, it's incredible. It's one of life's miracles. Um, Another one as well is also seeing that in the grandmother, like mm. the grandmother, and, you know, and she just wanted to, she wanted to come over to, you know, at the hospital so much just to have a few. And so it's funny, she will often come over and early in the first couple of weeks, like the baby's not doing much awake time. So if there was, I'd be like, Hey, Hey, I would make sure like get baby to grandmother, like change quickly. And you have like 10 minutes before Zoe's going to start to feed grandmother to get, to, you know, grandma can get some time. And so that was really beautiful to watch and then my family my sister my mom and dad my my step um my brother-in-law and nephew are all in wales so they're you know over the pond far far away and yet the power of zoom and the power of like the number of times we've just had there so it's like we're around the table except they're on a the computer screen but we're around a table having a you know a meal and we've got henry and zoe and i and a iPad and people on the screen and we are sharing a moment, you know, sharing time together. I mean, that is, you know, compared to, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, um, that would have been a very different experience, you know, for, for family that is very, very far away. I think it's one of the great gifts that we have of living in today's time, yeah. right? Medical, Medical technology is way better. Medical science is way better. Um, health is is way better. Longevity is way better. 
and now connected this, right? It's one of the, the great things um, of this time period. Uh, any final, uh, any final observations or, uh, any wisdom you want to impart to our feel good fathers? So it's a very strange, amazing, weird experience. Um, one of the most profound, I had two incredibly profound moments for me. The first one was um, waiting to go into the OR ahead of the C-section. So I was put in scrubs. We knew, we'd seen some training video about what a C-section would look like, but I didn't really know what the OR would really look like. And they're like, put scrubs, and they're like, wait here in the hallway, and we're going in, we're going to get, but mom's being taken in. There's lots of prep work to be done, and we'll call you in. And so I don't know if I was there for 10 minutes or 30 minutes. It felt like a lifetime. It was, this is probably about 1.30 a.m. in the morning. The hospital halls are quiet, empty. I'm on there on my own. And I had this very surreal moment of just standing there and being like, this is about, I've got goosebumps thinking about it. Like, this is about to happen. And it was just, I don't know, like, I, 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 I stopped and appreciated. I stopped and reflected. I stopped. It was just like, this is a pivotal moment. Like things are about to change. This is a moment where, and there was, there was some anxiety and fear. There's a big operation about to happen. Um, and then there is a, there we have a medical, amazing medical science and, you know, the thing now, so that's something that is a, is a crazy procedure. Let's be completely clear. This is the crazy procedure. Um, is actually done so regularly and so with such success that it's like this is a big deal but this is totally routine normal and you know um and so that was this moment of just waiting and anticipating a moment of calm not before the storm but just of sort of calm before the next chapter so that was surreal and i sort of i mean it was almost like a spiritual moment for me um and then the, the 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 one then was it wasn't even just the miracle when the baby's brought out, but there's a moment. It takes forty minutes to sew mom back up after a C-section, um, and there's this whole process. And whilst there's a screen, you see the baby and things can sort of be handed and whatever. But then there's stuff to do, and there was this moment where so there, you know, the the, the nurses are helping baby, and there's this moment where I have my finger and his hand is wrapped around my finger on the warming table as they're doing various checks and stuff. And then my other hand is on, is holding Zoe's hand. And it's like this bridge we're like connected in this moment as she's there looking over, you know, at baby, but also they are sewing her up and doing whatever. Like, so she is like really being a total champ right now. And just that whole experience there of like, this is a human, this is a new human being. This is a new soul that's just entered this the physical world now and this connection. And it was just, it was very magical. And in particular, and I would encourage any feel good father, this was such a beautiful experience. And we were in an OR. Let's be clear. Everyone's in scrubs. There are lights. This is not some soothing music, like relaxed birthplace or whatever. Um, but it was a, it was a celebration, right? Like the photographer was so light-hearted and kind and the conversation we had the, the anesthesiologist he was a super he was a, definitely an anesthesiologist but he was very he also was kind and you know he was lacking some emotion but it was like you could tell the intent the, the, the intent and everything it was just a, it was an experience that unlike any other and i would encourage any feel good or future feel good father out there um to not be concerned or uh, have fear or apprehension should that be the path that your birth goes because it mm. can still be an extremely special experience um it can be it can you can still ex you still experience the miracle of birth and um and uh, it will be forever forever in our you know we'll never forget it i think that's fantastic hugh thank you so much for part two congratulations on being a dad and welcome to the brotherhood I'm honored to be part. Thank you so much. It was an absolute delight for me to be here on the Feel Good Father podcast. And if if you enjoyed this conversation and want to hear more about this crazy journey of becoming a father and living life as a father, hit the subscribe button. Uh, I'll be following along with you. Awesome. And also right here, 
there's another video playing. So this is the one that YouTube thinks you should be watching. So check it out. I hope it's one of mine. You'll know. You'll know it is because it's got that nice blue brick background, but it should be right there. Click it. Click it. It's the next one.